It is 545, so I'll, I will call to order the Thursday, December 1st, 2022, regular meeting of the Hendersonville City Council. We begin our meetings with a silent invocation for people to pray or meditate as they choose, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you will rise, please. You'll join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We open with public comment time. We have two people signed up here in person. Um, would you check and see if there is anyone online who would want to c comment? If, if so, if you could raise your hand just so we can get a count. Mayor, there are no hands raised online. Okay. So we have uh, just two people then. Um, still would appreciate if you would limit your remarks to about four minutes. Um, First is, and, and when you come forward, if you would give your name and address for the clerk's record, please. So first, uh, first is Gloria Jennings. Hey, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't know. I do apologize, I didn't mean to sign up for comments. Mm -hmm. But I'm just gonna state my name and say I'm Gloria Jennings, Gloria Cynthia Jennings. I live here in Hendersonville, North Carolina now at 664 Beach Street. Uh, me and my daughter, we just purchased a brand new home over there where I used to live at years, years back. Amen. Thank you. God has been good and blessed us there. Um, just want to see more going on in the Hendersonville City. Just want to see more updating things and what's going on in the community area as well. Um, I feel like things are doing, people are doing some good jobs. The officers and everybody are doing a good job in their in their respectable place. Um, but we'll still like to see more things going on and cleaning up, um, mainly down in Green Matters, you know, so children can be safe in that area to play as well. Maybe can also can try to clean up in that area. I know with the situation with the swamp. Um, the park has been named after my daughter's uh, late grandfather, the J.H. Sullivan, and I just thank God for the park being in his name. So just want to see more things being done. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you back here. Um, Lynn Williams. Hello. <clears throat> Good evening. First, I want to start. Oh, Lynn Williams, Chadwick Avenue. I think I'd have that by now. First, I want to start by saying thank you to the council and to all the staff members for all your service this past year, and including Mr. Conant. I know you've worked very hard. I also want to thank you for hearing the voices of the concerned citizens in the last city council meeting where you decided to practice due diligence in the 7th Avenue revisioning process. That was very meaningful to us, and thank you for hearing our voice. Um, today, I'm going to provide another update on Boyd Park. So um, after attending the special meeting called by the Henderson County mm -hmm. School Board, I discussed the priority to preserve the historic sections of Boyd Park with the chairman of the board. The key point he emphasized is that nothing is stopping the council from building the fire station or admin building at Edwards Park. This ingenious solution utilizes the best options available. Not only will historic historic Boyd Park have space to exist as it has for over 80 years, but this will avoid the dreaded inconvenience of relocation while the new facilities are being constructed. This will ensure the 2023 season at Laura Ecorn Mini Golf will not be canceled or postponed. Upgrades to the mini golf course can continue as outlined in the current park and green space plan developed under the council, under the council of members Smith and Mayor Volk's direction. A little bit more here. I urge the council to pause on decisions regarding Boyd Park's preservation until key stakeholders like the HPC and the Parks and Green Space Master Plan Committee can filter valuable and necessary input to leadership and council. One additional member to the Parks and Green Space Committee I would recommend potentially is Carl Hill, the past parks director. 
as well as the new sustainability and parks position. Having served on the ESB sustainability plan subcommittee, I am in full support of a much needed full-time sustainability position that will save countless dollars through utilization and transitioning to renewable resources with new funding sources through grants and other initiatives. Let's see. All right, and as a follow-up to the public comment last month, can there be clarification about the public's concern about the delayed response time on the south side of Main Street if the fire department will be relocated? And my one request is that Councilwoman Hensley refrain from invalidating my perspective after I complete this comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Same password. All right. Um, the agenda is in front of you. Is there anything anyone would like to add to or have removed from the agenda? There is just one item under the consent agenda, the um, minutes for the November 3rd meeting were not complete. So that should be removed and that we will uh, approve uh, next month. Is there anything else anyone would like to have added to or removed from the agenda? If not a motion to, to approve the agenda. Madam Mayor, I move that the City Council approve the agenda as amended. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Not those in favor of approving the agenda as amended say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. We have the agenda, consent agenda. Is there anything anyone would like to have moved from the consent agenda to the regular agenda so it can be discussed. If not, a motion to approve those items. Madam Mayor, I move that the City Council approve the consent agenda as presented. Okay. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Not those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 As opposed say no. Ayes have it. Very good. Uh, got those taken care of. Uh, presentations. City of Hendersonville Academy graduates. Connor, if you could explain what the yes. City Academy is. I will. I'll ask Ms. Okay. Luann Welter and all of our graduates from the Academy to please come forward, everyone that participate, all of our teammates that participate. So as part of our leadership development program uh, through our HR department, we established the, the City of Hendersonville Academy, which is a six-week, Luann, six-week program where um, our um, teammates give up one night a week, and um, they learn about all things about the city, whether it's form of government and how the city manager works with the city council, um, about budgeting, about all things, uh, just different things in our organization that will help them to have the skills as they become leaders in our organization. So it's opportunity for folks to come and have that to develop that leadership training um, under, under the guidance of HR coordinator Luann Welter and the members of our department head. And these folks give up um, basically um, two to at least two hours once a week for six weeks to really learn about the city and things that are not in what they do day in and day out. So they, it's time away from their family. So mm -hmm. we appreciate them uh, giving up and taking about 12 hours to develop the more leadership skills um, and so they can move up in the organization. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's here or not, but uh, I'm pleased to be able to recognize the employees that, that have gone above and beyond to uh, see how uh, better how the city operates and how they fit into the process. Um, Steve Alberson, I'd like to just give them to you and we'll let you go ahead and hand them out. <coughs> Tim, uh, Tim Calderazzo. So before the mayor calls, and I'll point out Tim works third shift at our wastewater treatment, no, water treatment plant. I've got that wrong every time, Tim. So you don't see him, but he's keeping the water flowing at night while we're asleep. Man. Yes. Appreciate it.
Randy Heatherly. Amanda Lofton. Not here tonight. Okay. How are you back here? Tracy Fletcher. Okay. Brent Pope and Nate Young. So thank you all for being here. I think uh, Steve Alverson needs to stay close at hand. Yes, and I'll ask uh, HR Director Jennifer Harrell to come up and recognize Steve. So Steve has uh, recently received his... Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Steve has recently received his uh, Manager of Environmental Safety and Health Certificate uh, from the state. Uh, it uh, is sponsored by the um, North Carolina Department of Labor, North Carolina State University, and the uh, Safety and Health Council of North Carolina. Steve has, uh, to earn this, he has went through 100 hours of vigorous training. Uh, that was uh, within the last year that he's done that. He has, um, the hours came from the uh, Western North Carolina Safety School Conference, completing the 30-hour OSHA um, class and 70 hours of safety classroom training. Uh, we really appreciate everything you've done, Steve, and thank you. Uh, I guess everybody knows you by safety, Steve, now. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, here is your certificate that came from the state. So thank you very much. You. We appreciate it. Uh, next, we're going to have a presentation, Propane Gas Vehicle Conversion. And Good evening. Hi there. Good evening. My name's Happy Fox with a company called Alliance Auto Gas. Thanks for the time to be able to make a presentation to you all tonight. We appreciate the invitation. Uh, with me tonight are a couple of co-workers. I'll point out uh, Chris Watts, our branch manager for Blossoming Gas here in Hendersonville. Our branch is just down here on Spartanburg Highway and Sterling Amber. He's our uh, head of service and maintenance for that facility as well. Mm -hmm. So they're here for backup in case I fumble or forget to tell you all something that we'd like to share with you tonight. So thank you again for the time. Uh, Blossoming Gas is our parent company. They've been in business since 1951. So we have a good long history of being in the propane industry. It was started in Mississippi. Now we expand up into about a dozen states. We cover the southeast, and we also cover the mid-Atlantic area with about 80-plus branches uh, and probably 800-plus employees. The division I work for is Alliance Auto Gas. We convert vehicles to be powered by propane, a biofuel system. I'll give you a little more information on that in a minute. We also have another division called Alliance Small Engines. That group converts lawnmowers and generators to be powered by propane. So both of those two entities, we work coast to coast and border to border, working with fleets and mowers to be converted to be powered by propane. We got started with the city of Hendersonville, so thank you all for being a customer, uh, with uh, Mr. <coughs> Kevin Rhodes, Tom Wooten, and Mark Starwalt. We got started with them a few years ago with mowers that were powered by propane. So that program got off to a good start. It went fairly smooth. The benefits of it have been savings for the fuel cost, maintenance cost, and a reduction of emissions from those mowers. So it's gone well enough to where recently they've added more mowers to their program. So that kind of laid a foundation for us to come before the sustainability <coughs> board, make a presentation, and to share with you all about a program for the vehicle side so that we could hopefully work with you all with a pilot program to introduce a program with the fleet for the city of Hendersonville. So the group 
excuse me. So we got started about 10 to 15 years ago. And what we do is we convert vehicles to be powered by propane. We're EPA certified. I'll give you all the details on that in a minute. But basically the most important thing is we like to do everything we can provide any service or support for a program to be successful. It is sometimes everybody's going uphill when you want to create a new change, whether it's technology or whether it's with an alternative fuel. So we like to work with conversion of the fleets, training and support of those fleets, providing the fuel for those vehicles. And then the most important part for us is providing service and training and support after a program is up and running. Because once it is up and running, everybody wants it to be successful. It's beneficial to, for both sides. So our systems are EPA certified. Our R&D center is in Asheville. Our warehouse is in Swannanoa. We ship parts throughout the country. We have training centers throughout the country, conversion centers throughout the country. With you all being close, in, close to our proximity, with being a customer for the mowers, we welcome the opportunity to present this program to you all tonight. Uh, we design them to be specialized to where they meet that certification. They're EPA certified. We add all the original components stay on the vehicle, and we add a tank, a filler valve, a computer underneath the hood, as well as all the components for that vehicle to be powered by propane. That's when you get the benefits. The fuel cost is lower, the emissions are lower. So with that process being started, when the vehicle starts on gas, as soon as it gets to engine temperature, it automatically switches over to being powered by propane. The original warranty stays in place. We offer our own warranty on our system as well. So anything, whether it's a part, installation, or where the fuel touches, if it is an issue due to the propane, we have our own warranty system. The diagnostic system that we have on the vehicle can be checked with a computer. We provide training for that. We provide that software. So that way the technicians can look and see, is it on the gasoline side or is it on the, or is it on the propane side? It's very important for us to be able to know that. And the way with, we work with the EPA, it's really important for us to make sure that we are meeting those emission, emission standards. We work with a wide variety of fleets, a wide variety of vehicles. This is just a company representation, so to speak, but we can convert sedans, we convert law enforcement cars, sedans and SUVs. We convert a lot of different types of trucks, as you see, and then we do specialized trucks as well, like our bobtails that deliver propane as well. So all of these vehicles are the same EPA system. They're just designed for each vehicle, whether it's a Dodge, whether it's a Ford, whether it's a Chevrolet. So we go through that whole process. The benefits, again, the key benefits are you're going to save about 35% on fuel cost. The other key benefit is it's going to be reduced emissions. Law enforcement like it because if they do have that program, they can stay out on a site. If there's an incident, they can stay on call longer because now they have extra fuel capacity. If the propane runs out, they can still, they can still run on gas. So it expands their range. Public transportation, a very similar entity. They like it because if there's a storm, of which many of our fleets do, they go and help pe move people away from the coast when there's a storm. If there's a disruption in the power or the gas line coming up, we can still get propane to vehicles and to people. So just a couple little littler points, but key points to the benefit of a program, if that makes sense. Again, other than fuel cost savings, the other is the reduction in emissions. Everybody benefits when we all have cleaner air and you mentioned cleaner water tonight as well. So this is just a representation of showing the gray is the emissions coming from a gasoline powered vehicle. The blue is, come, is in, how much less comes out of a vehicle that is powered by propane. This is a pinch picture of our branch here in Hendersonville. So a lot of people say, well, where do I get fuel? How can I get fuel? So for your all's pilot program, this site here is available 24 seven. It is a card reader system that it makes it easy for us to adapt other vehicles and to allow access for people to refuel there. Along with that program, you can also do, we have an online portal to where you can look online and see whether the pilot program vehicles or other near fleet refueled at this site as well. So we adapt the fuel to meet the customer's needs. For a pilot program for Hendersonville, it would make sense to just start out using that site. That way it's not an investment and it's pretty easy and it's available 24 seven. With many other fleets, we have a site, we put it on site for them like MB Haynes or Mountain Mobility or Haywood County Transportation. 
We put fuel for them. We have on fuel site fuel for them. With others, we might have a shared site to where other fleets and other people could refuel for their vehicles as well. These are a couple of the key components here. In the middle there is the nozzle that is used to uh, connect a vehicle to be able to re-refuel. It's called a quick connect nozzle. So you know when you go get a grill cylinder filled, the, general, the service tech is usually wearing gloves and wearing eye protection. With this, when you're refilling a vehicle, this has been in place for a few years now, you don't have to wear any gloves or no eye protection. It simply clicks on. When it is connected, you can pull the lever and it'll disperse fuel. When it gets full, it shuts off just like it does. And you literally just hear, you hear a pfft, and that's all. It's, technically, it's a low emission nozzle is what it's called. So the benefit of that is if that nozzle is not connected properly to it, you can't just disperse propane like you can with a nozzle for diesel or gasoline. It's got to be connected. You all might have something similar with your CNG to where it's got to be connected properly to refuel. On the left, on the your left, excuse me. On the left hand side there is a picture of a, a typical dispenser that we would put on site. And if your program were to grow, this is something that we would, we would offer to provide as well. We provide the tank and the dispenser at no charge. It's included in the program. The customer usually pays for the electrical connection and the safety post. With, with that being said, we do make sure permits are followed, codes are followed, and that it's at an easy access point for the fleet to be able to use. It is a portable unit, it can be moved. It's not fun to move them a lot of times, but it can be moved. But it takes up about a little bit larger than a parking spot, is about how much space it takes up. In the middle picture there, you see that's a card reader. It works pretty similar to a credit card. It's just, it's just our company card that we, not ours, but a service that we have that allows for fleets to be able to track their fuel. Data management is critical and important for all fleets. This is one key component for everybody to be able to have as well. So we're here more to talk about Ural's fleet, but the other game changer in the propane industry the last few years has been propane buses. Propane buses has really made a key point to be able to take away arguments of the safety of propane. The movie industry hasn't done us any favors to where someone takes a small grill cylinder, shoots it, and a city block is destroyed. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. <laughs> it is a very safe fuel. We need to respect all fuels, no matter what it is, gas, diesel, propane, CNG, it doesn't matter. But it has made a key impact. Those benefits are the benefits that, we, that the city of Hendersonville and other fleets have when they operate a propane program. They're saving fuel costs, they're reducing emissions, maintenance costs are generally almost always lower, and it, it gives you more flexibility in a fuel to where it expands your range. So to jump to the second part here, to give you some really quick details, this is a, uh, information for a proposal that we would like to share information with you all to help decide if a pilot program would be beneficial to the city of Hendersonville. So on the left hand side there you see that's one vehicle. We took a range of, after meeting with the other gentleman here in Hendersonville, we took a range of about 12,000 miles. A vehicle gets eight miles per gallon. The average fuel price over that report that we received was about a little over three dollars. The average price for propane during that period was about $1.45. So if you see to the column on the far right, for one vehicle, that would be about a $2,200 savings per year if it were operating on propane versus gasoline. Below that is one system conversion. We took, again, taking the average price of fleets for vehicles in Hendersonville, whether it's a truck or a van or another vehicle, the system would cost about $6,300, and it would be about 2.8 years of a return on investment. So most fleets that we work with get four years or less. Some fleets get only a year. If they're going 20,000 miles in a year, that return is gonna be even faster. The city of Hendersonville and your proximity, that's a pretty fair number. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't say your vehicles are gonna be 15 or 20,000 miles in a year, but some may. But if they're going eight to 10 to 12,000 miles in a year, it's gonna be a three year or less program for return on the investment for the city of Hendersonville. Our proposal would be to convert a range of two to four vehicles that would be jointly selected to make sure that they were the right fit for the city and for a test program. We would convert them at no charge, convert them over. The only thing the city of Hendersonville would pay for during that time would be the fuel. It would be done with a card reader, so it would be easy to access online or to be able to share the details with anybody that would want to see those details. 
at the end of that period, whether it's 90 days, six months, whatever the, whatever the agreement term would be, we're very flexible with that program. We would want to sit down, and when we sit down during that time, we would literally look at, okay, over this period of time, how much would we have spent on gas during these miles? How much did we spend on propane? Is there really a true cost savings? We would talk to the drivers. How did the vehicle perform? And did it, did, was it fueling as easy as they said it was, or as simple as they said it was? It's literally a little three item checklist. And we put that in the agreement. And that way it, it holds us accountable. And it gives both of us, because we want it to be a win-win, it gives both of us an opportunity to look at something to see, is this a viable program? Would it be a good fit? If that makes sense. So that is a whole lot of information. This PowerPoint is available, I think, to any of you all. Uh, our guys are here and available, and uh, we live here. If we need to, we would be glad to come by, do a different meeting. You're invited to come to Asheville to our R&D facility. If you want to test drive our vehicles, we can get something for you to test drive because the more comfortable you are with it, the more you know about it, the more you can make an informed decision. And that's the key. If you all are comfortable with it, you need to make a good decision. Thank you. Happy. This is my contact information. And if uh, I don't know if it's appropriate now for questions and answer, I tried to be really fast and timely, but if there is time, I got guys here to support me. We we'd welcome to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Fox? <coughs> so the offer you said that you just made was two to four vehicles. Can, can we go back one slide? Oh, sorry. You have it. <clears throat> yeah. So in other words, that estimated cost of conversion for one vehicle on there is $6,300. We would not for that two to four to test vehicles. We would not have to pay that. You you would you during the test period you would not pay that. We 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 can't literally just give li totally give those to you all. But during that test period, we wouldn't charge anything to put them on. We would tell you the price of those systems that we were putting on there, and then at the end of the test period, if you all said we'd like to move forward, keep these vehicles moving forward, then we then, for we, then you could pay for them, and we would work out according to your budget. We would work out with your budget to on the timing of your budget to make sure that that could follow within your budget parameters, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you weren't happy with the pro not no pun intended because of my name, but <laughs> if if you weren't if you were dissatisfied, we would take the systems off and the restore the vehicles to where they just operate on gasoline, just like they were before we, before we did the conversions. Um, is there anyone else that sells propane gas? Uh, In yes. In other words, are we required to buy our propane gas from you during the test program you would be required to buy it from us because we would want to have full right. access to that after that we work with other municipalities if it needs to be bid out we understand that it needs to be bid out uh, the same propane that other propane providers are providing that goes in a gas grill is the same propane that we have those are my two questions Anyone else? Are the prices um, for per gallon, are those like a, a standard fleet price or are these like what like any regular citizen would pay? This, is, this price on here at $1.45 per gallon is the price for the city of Hendersonville okay. at, when we did this proposal or okay. about a few weeks ago before we turned it so in. So there is like a fleet discount type thing? Yeah. So. Um, uh, just like with gasoline, there's a cost of it, and then each company marks it up to where they get a margin. For the city of Hendersonville, there's no taxes, so there's no tax on that. There is a tax credit right now that is available to the government or non-government entities of 37 cents per gallon. So that is figured into this factor as well. It goes through 2022, 2023, and 2024. Okay. So that it's an alternative fuel tax credit. It's an incentive for fleets to convert over. So, uh, but like if, uh, if a customer, a, a public user came through, they would pay probably 50, 50 more cents, 54 more cents per gallon if it was me, a taxpayer, coming through to get that. So I would pay about $2 for propane. We're generally going to run about 35% cheaper than gasoline. Okay. So gas right now is about $3, right? Roughly a little so. Propane is going to be a little, about, about $2 as a general rule. Did, uh, that, did that answer? It did. did. Thank you. Also, um, I know this technology is relatively new, and so what are the long-term studies on the life expectancy of engine and operation of the vehicle being bi-powered like this? Good question, really good question. Um, propane, uh, there's about 28 to 30 plus million vehicles around the world 
that are uh, powered by propane. In the United States, we're probably maybe 100,000 or a million to a million. It's not, it's not a real big number here in the United States, closer to a million probably. But uh, uh, the technology has been uh, more prevalent in Europe for a long time and in Asia. Over here, it got, it got running in the 70s and 80s. It kind of dipped in the 90s. And then when the EPA started kicking in and st started going on there, then it started ramping back up. Uh, we came on board with Prins, which is from the Netherlands. Uh, to, we came on board with them to get their system. And uh, we've been running, the city of Kingsport's had a program since 2010 or 12. They have about 100 vehicles in their program. Uh, I talked to a transportation company this week that started a program in 2015, and they're still running well. Uh, the personal truck that I used to drive had 265,000 miles on it. And 20, it was a 2015 with no issues. So generally propane, it's cleaner. It's like a clear liquid like water. So there's no carbon buildup like there is with gasoline. Okay, thank so, you. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ramble no. there. Sorry. Can Any I? Questions? Oh, I, I, well, I know this is not a city. Can an individual person have this done to their vehicle? Yes, they can. I mean, not a fleet. Like, if I want to go in there and have my car done, I can do that. Yes, sir. I don't have, a, we, we gear towards fleet. Oh, I got you. I know the numbers might change, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just fleets. Like, if an individual would like to have that done, you can have that done to your car. We, we have individuals, not very many, but we gear towards fleets. But we have fleets as small as two to three vehicles, and we have fleets that uh, get over 100. So, but, yes, an individual can do it. And it, we, we don't offer this deal, obviously, or this no, I proposal. Got that, but I didn't know if you had to be a but, fleet to have this done. No, sir. No, sir. And we have 24-7 site, sites in Asheville here and many other places that we share with people that have an individual vehicle. Okay. Other questions? Okay. You need anything from us or? Uh... I, I think what, you know, unless there's an objection, I think um, Tom Wooten and, and Mark and, and folks in our fleet division have met with Happy and his team. And I think we'd like to continue the discussion further um, and explore doing a pilot program on a couple of vehicles and see how it goes. Um, and work and identify those vehicles and um, see what happens, um, particularly as it relates to um, looking for alternative fuels. So. Okay. Anyone have objections to moving forward? No. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fox, for Sounds being great. here. Sounds great. And your, your comments as well. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Seventh Avenue branding presentation. Oh, yay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, we are excited to share our uh, branding with 7th Avenue that we've been working on for a while now. And we're excited to reveal it. And everyone here tonight is treated to an early Christmas present. So stick around after you see the final product. Um, so we started the 7th Avenue branding in... Um, particularly because of the 7th Avenue streetscape investments that are going to be happening in this spring. And we went through a long process to uh, get to the, the point of where we are now um, with our community character team, a steering committee that was formed, starting with the selection of the consultant, which we went with Arnett Muldrow, who had done our H logo many, many years ago, which we all know and love. <clears throat> and then um, over the summer, we um, had a three-day session of roundtables, uh, including business and property owners, residents of the Green Meadows area uh, neighborhood and other surrounding neighbors, um, the downtown advisory board, and a public meeting. Overall, there was about 60 people who participated in those meetings, and we had a, a really good conversation. Um, at the end of that three-day session, the Guys with Arnett Muldrow were super fast and created a great design concept that our steering committee all universally liked. Um, then that was reviewed by the downtown advisory board who gave unanimous approval and support of it as well. So we we're hoping that everyone enjoys it and everyone likes it. And I'm going to turn it over to Sean Turpak uh, to talk a little bit more about it. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you all for having us up here. Um, I was joking with her before uh, the meeting started tonight that my wife and I love Hendersonville, so it was really nervous coming up here. 
uh, to do this project because I didn't want to mess it up because I want to <laughs> still be able to enjoy Hendersonville. Uh, and so we're super proud of what we were, what we put together, and we really appreciate all of the work that Jamie and her team put into this. She put together some really good uh, committee, uh, some good groups that we were able to talk to, really good conversations, some really difficult conversations as well. Um, actually, one of them took place in this room, talking about the history, about the Seventh Avenue district, and um, you know. But we like to be as authentic as we can when we're working in any community. So we want to hear the good, the bad, and the indifferent, um, so that we can hopefully you know, reflect that back to the community and come up with something authentic for them. And so I'd like to walk through uh, some of that, the inspiration behind it, as mentioned with not just the conversations, but looking at some of the identities that we were inheriting as we came into the community. Uh, as alluded to, we were fortunate enough, it was before my time with the company, to have d done the downtown brand, I think in 2008 or so. And, uh, somewhere around there. I, I, again, it was before my time, but you all have done an incredible job, and we use uh, images that we've taken from Hendersonville all across the country to show what implementation can look like in communities. Uh, you've done tremendous work from your, your gateway signs to your streetscaping and even your street uh, furniture and everything. You've, you've done tremendous work. Uh, but also looking at the historic 7th Avenue District with the depot identity and what parts of that we can take inspiration from and, and looking at how it's currently being utilized. What are we updating? What are we replacing? And you know, where are we going to go and how are we going to utilize this brand? And so we start digging in and asking questions and having these conversations and looking for other inspiration and understanding the railroad heritage and history in this community was very important to a lot of people that we spoke to and and it's unique for 7th Avenue in the context of downtown and how sort of the density of and the, the business centric focus of downtown has shifted over the years uh, but we liked the idea of what was happening at the depot being a bit of this focal point it's a very unique depot with its uh, turret there as well, but looking at the colors, looking at the shapes of, of what's uh, you know been happening through history, but also something that was interesting in the conversations that we had was talking about the historic Brooklyn neighborhood, and so we did a little digging, and Trip happened to come across the idea, uh, the the reality that there's a Seventh Avenue stop on the subway in Brooklyn, New York. And I was looking at some of the imagery around like subway signage and something started to click in this idea of this mosaic, these pieces of a puzzle that are coming together and, and formulating you know, a, a bigger picture with all these unique designs. And we were looking at the architecture in downtown and in the 7th Avenue district and even Maple Street still having the brick paved road there uh, and, and thinking of ways that you know, this concept can tie into even the B-line where, you know, you've got this hexagonal pattern that goes down your, your sidewalks and connects the neighborhoods. And, you know, looking at other colors, we were inspired by some of the history in the old uh, historic high school yearbooks even, looking at some of these with the blues and the golds. You know, we really like taking inspiration from the history of a community or a district like this so that we can bring those stories forward and we continue to tell that tale just in modern ways. And so, oh, apparently that was a Pantone color in the existing, which uh, does not come through well in PowerPoint, I believe. So those two black dots should actually be the existing Hendersonville green and blue in downtown, so I apologize for that. Uh, but what we did was looked at that and we wanted to broaden the palette. We wanted, you know, the original Hendersonville brand was done as part of a bigger project and so it was a little bit more of, uh, of an isolated sort of exercise at the time it was done. So we wanted to broaden the palette because as you all have grown with that identity, you're using it in a lot of different ways from your farmer's market and seasonal events and different things. So we wanted to uh, add some color to this and update the colors a little bit. So there are some modif slight modifications to the blue and green used, but we also built that out to add a paired green and blue with that. 
as well as the red and the gold that kind of shows it a little bit of that history, a little bit of the architecture, and then the yellow and the tan to just build this out. Some of these colors will be used much more than others. Some of them are just in the toolkit to have when the need arises. So um, you might not always see all of them you know, in a big floral pattern, but there are some really nice designs with them all that, that we do hope you like and utilize. And so again, with the typefaces, we did inherit a few of these from the existing brand, but we created, we added um, some, some updates to uh, the sans serif typeface, the secondary Montserrat, again, to just kind of modernize things a little bit, put a little bit more thought into the overall product. Uh, you know, we, even part of this, we are updating the Hendersonville downtown brand just ever so slightly. Nobody will ever notice it, but it was just some things I noticed as, as getting back into it and working with it, you know, all these years later that some things that needed just some minor tweaks and adjustments and, and making this whole system feel very cohesive and an evolution of, of what was done. So part of this process is a narrative that we create for the community. And I know I only have limited time, so I'll try to read quickly, but not too rushed. It is here that the history of Hendersonville evolves when the Transylvania Railroad connected Hendersonville to the towns and resorts of Western North Carolina in the late 1800s. By the early 1900s, a large depot that still stands today used drays to carry the bounty of Henderson County's orchards and farms to Asheville, Spartanburg, and points beyond. It is here that freed African Americans came from rural settlements like the Kingdom of the Happy Land to seek opportunity and employment around the depot and in businesses of 7th Avenue. The <coughs> district was surrounded by a thriving neighborhood called Brooklyn that would bear witness to redevelopment, removal, and displacement. Today, green meadows and legacy businesses stand as reminders of the diverse history here. It is here that our landmark depot stands sentinel, surrounded by commercial buildings, diverse businesses, and a new energy on the avenue. Inspired by entrepreneurs, our opening businesses and renovating buildings. Farmers once again gather here to sell fruit, vegetables, and food to people who come from near and far. Artists are transforming once barren spaces into places of whimsy and imagination. And trains still travel now on model tracks, sparking the imagination of young and old. 7th Avenue is part of the grand adventure of downtown Hendersonville, a place that sets the standard of what a revitalized downtown can be. We invite you to enjoy a stroll along the avenue, experience the intricate mosaic of our history, revel in the art of our galleries and on the street, explore places where repurposing what is old into something new is part of our rich character. We are Seventh Avenue, downtown's creative edge. Let's go. Okay. So this is a type treatment of of the logo. Uh, with you see that mosaic pattern back there, uh, with the tagline there. And so we have a few different constructs of this, but the you know that brand statement we really want to try to encapsulate as much as we can about the history, um, but also some of the aspirations of the character of that district. And you know those different paragraphs can be utilized in marketing. They can, you know, there's a lot of different ways we can use those. But we really want to kind of set this platform of what we heard from the community and the stories we heard, and the inspiration that everybody has about this community. And um, so we wanted to keep the design overall fairly simple. We're dealing with Seventh Avenue, and uh, yeah. So we created just a simple typeface. And I have to give credit and a certain percentage of our fee, uh, <laughs> undisclosed percentage, to Jamie for the idea of actually carrying the uh, Hendersonville H over into the design for 7th Avenue. So again, we want to create that connectivity to the, the community at large, but recognizing that this is definitely a unique character district. And so then the main, I, the main logo, that the construct that we came up with was this sort of mosaic or brick type pattern and tile pattern around the 7th Avenue district and you know originally it was definitely more brick and and Jamie said at the beginning that you know everybody fell in love with this at, at first sight and and we like to think that's true but there's definitely some feedback in in this process where you know we presented ideas and they came back with some really good feedback that allowed us to refine this and come up with something that is much stronger uh, and then, as I mentioned, with having all those colors, we wanted to show a variation of this 
that provides a lot of color and we can see this in street art or on a building or in embroidery you know there's just a lot of ways we can play with these colors but we still want to make sure that it works in a refined color palette for embroidery or other things that you know you don't need all the colors or you don't want to spend the extra um, production money in doing uh, you know it's it's really helpful for a community to have these tools that function in a lot of different capacities across a broad array of media. And then taking the idea of that mosaic and, and utilizing the train tracks, you know, so where when they live next to one another, you see that consistency in the shape, but carrying over the identity that the depot is currently using into a little bit more of a modern construct. And how can this live in the wild? You know, we saw at the beginning how it's living there now, it's on the post, but if we can create these medallions that live like finials up on the top, I'm sure many of you have been down into downtown Asheville. If you've ever paid attention to their wayfinding, they have a lot of finials on the top of their signposts, which is really unique because different artists, I don't know how many different ones they do, but they vary throughout the city. And then even bannering. Uh, to show, you know, this is a corridor, this is a district, so let people know that they've arrived into a different character district of, you know, downtown. It, this is a really affordable way to add some color to the streetscape. Uh, you can use these for events or just sort of that, that pride of place. You know, what that looks like replacing one of the existing banners on the corridor. And then what a uh, gateway sign could look like for the district based on your existing gateway sign that you have with that really nice core 10 laser cut um, or plasma cut uh, sign you have out there. You know, how can we take that and, and carry it through? And this could be done in core 10 as well, I believe. Uh, it might take a little bit more trial and error for the fabricator, um, but we could definitely see this. And hopefully that, that triangle presents an interesting problem as well, but that's above my pay grade. <laughs> and so pedestrian wayfinding, you know, with the Beeline Trail and other, the, the Acousta Trail and other trails that are happening and, and trying to create the connectivity between downtown and 7th Avenue is a really important component to our thought process in this uh, because we have a lot of people, you know, that that want to park and want to be able to walk, but they don't necessarily know that off of Main Street, there's Hendersonville has a lot more to offer. And so if we can create these, these breadcrumbs and this connectivity between Main Street and 7th Avenue, we feel like we can create a lot more connectivity between the businesses and the events and, and just make it a lot more comfortable to people, for people to traverse between the other two, between the two without having to necessarily try to find multiple parking spots for their day. And then even as you start going through the streetscape process of, you know, having some signs out there that let people know that businesses are open and that, you know, this is an improvement project that uh, we will all get through together uh, because we know how difficult it can be to, to get people to, you know, go to a place when the sidewalks are in decent condition. Uh, whenever they're torn up and you're having to get people around, it can be even more difficult. So we definitely want to try to think about creative ways of, of creating that awareness and putting people at ease. And then some of the ads that we put together, you know, these can be put on social media. These are just sort of kind of community pride, internal pride sort of pieces that we just want to show with a lot. Usually the, the next few are more graphic intensive, just at the image, but show what this creative edge, how expandable it can be for Hendersonville and let people know that this is, you know, the, the artistic edge, the historic edge, you know, savory. You know, we, we like putting all these different words in there because, you know, the, the 7th Avenue is kind of a bit on the edge of downtown, but we, we want to make it feel like it, it's that destination that you can go and you can have all these different experiences uh, from businesses to art to resources and, and events. And just a, a small sample of some of the offerings that you have there to kind of demonstrate the creativity of the district, but also downtown's unique edge with the train still running in town, downtown's musical edge, and downtown's delicious edge, and how it can look, you know, embroidered on a hat or printed on a t-shirt. 
So those are just some, some of the examples of some of the, the swag that, you know, that can be done and, and just, uh, you know, we're just kind of scratching the surface here of what we foresee this being utilized as since you all have done such an incredible job already implementing the downtown brand. We're really excited to see what you all do with, with the 7th Avenue district brand as well. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Questions, comments? That's good. That's good. Yeah. And then, looks real good. Mm -hmm. yeah. You gotta have t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have t-shirts. We've got cats. Anyone would like to take one home with you today? Yes, please. Yes. And um, a long sleeve shirt. Yes. Please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone would like to take one home with you today? And a short sleeve t-shirt. And so I will have these over at the door. We're on your way out. <laughs> Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And Thank you. Okay. Questions, comments? Anyone? I've been geeking out over this ever since we had our initial meetings. Like, I'm so excited for you all to see it because I think that they did a fantastic job of taking the feedback from all of the different meetings and putting it in something that everyone can be proud of. Thank you. I think it looks great. Um, I have a lot of history there. Um, my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather actually helped lay the brick on that road. Oh, wow. And then my mom grew up right there where Nelson's uh, feed and seed is. Yeah, so she had the, the pleasure of playing at the train depot and all of that. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. I'm glad Job to hear well that. Done. Thank you very much. Right. Looks good. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right. All right. Uh, going from Seventh Avenue to a flood sensor system. Let's go. Let's go. I need a new brand. Uh, need a nice logo. So, um, uh, Madam Mayor, members of Council, thank you all for having me here this evening. Um, I'm just going to provide a brief update on our new flood sensor system and a couple of uh, interesting projects and updates just about the program in general. Um, so if you haven't been paying attention to the news the last couple days, we just installed our new flood sensor system. Um, so a little bit background on the project. Um, I believe it was shortly after Chief Myhan joined us that we uh, identified a need to have a better uh, flood response um, and uh, so we developed uh, a, a a planning group was developed in around I think July 2021 um, and that internal planning group was really focused on improving our you know emergency responses in, in terms of flooding and um, through that it was identified a need to have a way to monitor flooding within the city um, and be able to know when certain roads and uh, different areas were going to start to flood and, and so we could prioritize where we're going to put out barricades and um, I believe at the time and until we got the system in basically um, staff would drive around and look at you know off the sides of bridges and look at water levels and say you know I think this road is going to flood in the next 30 minutes it was very heavily based on forecasting um, and so uh, through the through the meetings of that group, uh, we you know came to the conclusion that we that we needed some type of system to to monitor water levels within the city. Um, so after that, we be, our the stormwater staff, myself and Dustin um, Dustin actually worked in uh, Mecklenburg County before he came here, um, and Mecklenburg County partnered with this group uh, that actually makes the flood sensors we have to develop a low cost flood monitoring system. So he was kind of on the, the front end of, of them developing that system before he ever came here. Um, and so we began researching different systems that are currently available and working with various agencies. Uh, we reached out to the National Weather Service. We talked with the Henderson County EMS. Uh, we talked with some folks from uh, FIMAN, which is a state-run program. It's called the Flood Inundation Mapping Alert Network. Um, and basically that's a, a program where they uh, 
take in data from monitor from USGS gauges and other gauges around the state and use predictive modeling to show, you know, during certain scenarios of storm events where flooding might occur. And you can sign up um, through that through that network to receive alerts uh, for when flooding might be occurring in your community. Uh, but like I said, they're reliant typically on USGS gauges and within the city of Hendersonville, we only have two active gauges. Both of them are located on Mud Creek. And unfortunately, recently one of the ones that's located on Irkwood Road went out of service. Um, and USGS being a national organization, uh, sometimes it can take them a while before they get around to fixing their sensors when they go down. Um, so, you know, I guess that's kind of bittersweet. It highlighted the need in, additionally for us to have our own system. Um, and so we researched, uh, there's not a lot of companies that produce this type of technology um, and these types of systems. And we researched and we kind of narrowed it down to two groups, two uh, companies and uh, ended up selecting IntelliSense. Um, they actually, developed this in association with Mecklenburg County, but also with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and their system is called the Aware Flood Sensor. So we purchased four of those sensors in uh, July of this year. And then just this last month, we were able to install them and get them calibrated. Um, and so, you know, in between that time of selecting the system, we had to prioritize, you know, the, the best places to put them, um, Typically, the best areas to put them are places where they have good, um, they're solar powered, so where they have good sun coverage, they're cellular based systems, so where there's good cell coverage, um, and then they obviously need to be close to the water. So we had to identify, you know, areas where we could mount them and easily monitor water levels. Um, so they have been installed. Um, this is the aware flood sensor system. This is what it looks like. Um, they're, you know, these pictures are up close. They're, they're very non-conspicuous um, out in the field. Uh, this one is mounted at uh, South Main Street. That's the South Main Street bridge there. And basically, the picture on the left is, a, is the, the little black box is the power module that uh, it's part of the auxiliary power module. And then the top node is, is what sends the data back to our uh, dashboard, which I'll show you in a second. And then the blue hockey puck type looking device is, is a little radar and it shoots a radar beam down at the water surface and as the water surface changes it can detect the depth of that water. Um, so the other system, um, not the other system, but another way that this can be done is with what's called a pressure uh, transducer and basically it's this little node that goes down in the stream and it can measure the pressure of that's being exerted on it by the water, and it determines the depth that way. The reason we decided to go with the radar system is that they are a little more expensive, but they're a lot lower maintenance. Um, the pressure systems that are in, in the stream can be covered up with dirt. They can get knocked out during really high flow events, which is when you want the system to be working. Um, and so we opted for the, uh, the radar system. And so uh, the AWARE stands for the Advanced Warning Equipment Flood Sensor. It's you know, a very simple, rugged, and relatively low cost um, sensor. If we were to request an additional USGS gauge be installed in the city, it's upwards of $10,000 per station. And then you have to pay an annual maintenance fee, which I believe is you know, around $12,000. Um, they detect and automatically alert the users, the users being our staff, um, when water either rises at a certain rate too quickly or when it reaches a certain depth threshold. And you can set three different depths uh, at each sensor uh, to trigger an alert. And, and it's continuously reporting water levels uh, using that self-sustaining battery, uh, which is operated off of a passive solar system. And then the water level radar, again, provides these high, I mean, up to a tenth of an inch uh, depth measurements of the water at all times. And Allison, if you wouldn't mind. So um, this is the dashboard right here. My time has expired. Uh, <laughs> I'll see you all next time. Uh, <laughs> so this is our dashboard that is uh, accessible to Currently, to our staff, um, there are you can go into this and 
adjust settings and things like that. So it is not currently a public dashboard. But this is one of the sensors. Um, the blue line that you see kind of stair-stepping down, that's the actual water level reading. The last reading, I believe, was at uh, 6, what is that, 615. Um, it's, yeah. So it sends the data package every 10 minutes because it is a cellular uh, operated system, and, and uh, that helps with maintaining the data. Um, it shows on the left the location, and then you can scroll down a little bit. Um, Allison, that would be great. Uh, and it actually will take a picture. Uh, we can schedule it um, to take as many pictures as we want, but uh, I just have it set up to take one picture a day. And then when the alerts begin to trigger, so when the water rises and it hits alert one, alert two, it'll take a picture then as well. Um, and these other, you can see it measures the ambient air pressure and then the battery voltage and signal strength on the bottom. Um, so pretty, pretty neat in my eyes, you know, pretty awesome, cool system, um, really uh, is going to help, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that it's going to help our emergency service staff, our fire, our police, our public works, um, our, you know, communication staff be, you know, on very on top of when flooding is occurring, when flooding is about to occur, and, and really, and, you know, be better prepared for when these events occur. Because prior to this system being in, it was, you know, totally based on forecasting. We would get a forecast that says it's going to snow or rain, um, you know, five inches over the next three days. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And then that, that leads to, you know, our staff going out and putting up barricades on roads that might not flood or getting out there and barricading a road that's already flooded. Um, and so we can really, you know, be very proactive in responding to flood events and then keeping our uh, citizens alerted to where flooding is occurring and when it's occurring. Um, and so you can go back to the, the presentation, please. Let's see. Oh, I'm not, so the four locations that we prioritized um, for installing these was, uh, we have two on 7th Avenue, um, one near uh, the entrance to the Greenway and then one down by Devil's Fork, uh, which is the stream that runs by the dialysis center, because we've had uh, reports from the dialysis center in the past of where they have actually been unable to get people in and out of the center because of flooding. Um, so we definitely want to be able to alert them and uh, you know keep them up to date of when we're expecting flooding and when that road might not be inaccessible. Um, the other ones we have are at Patton Park. Obviously, that's a high traffic area um, that floods relatively <laughs> frequently, um, and you know. So we wanted to be able to keep eyes on that location, and then obviously the, the location we're all familiar with, uh, seven, or South Main Street and the intersection of Greenville Highway and Spartanburg Highway, we have one monitoring there. Um, and so when everything is, you know, we're working on getting these fine-tuned so that, you know, if, if water is rising and we know that at this water depth, we're going to start seeing water come onto Caswell Street and come onto South Grove Street and then come onto, uh, you know, the entrance to the Fresh Market there off of South Church. We can have alerts set six inches before that occurs so that we know, okay, water's rising two inches an hour or five inches an hour and we have an hour or we have 30 minutes before uh, this area is going to be flooded. And then we can actively monitor the flood level and then also understand when, the, and those alerts work up and down. So when the water comes back down, it sends another alert that says you've, you know, gone below this, this threshold. Um, so that's, that's the aware flood system in a, in a nutshell. Um, does anybody have any questions before I proceed? Yes, sir. May I go first? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to ask this question, but can this be hacked? In other words, um, someone hack into this and it looked like there's a flood and there's not one. Or there is a flood and it doesn't indicate it. That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm sure somebody out there could figure out how to hack into it. Why they would want to do that, I'm, I'm not... Well, it's the same as the, the robocalls that are calling in shooters on campus. Okay. You've got, yes. A way to just disrupt government. That's, True. That's why I asked that question. True. It, so it, there is a login. Um, it, that's one, you know, it's not open to the public. Um, and, and so unless, the, I'm sure someone could hack it. I'm not right. going to say it's unhackable. There's a but private login. Yeah, there, it's not just like you click the link and goes to the dashboard. It's, it, there's a, a login that has been shared internally, but we will not, you know, share that externally. Um, Sorry to ask this again. How protected are these from vandalism? 
So that is a great question. They are, all the systems are cable locked uh, to the bridge that they are on. So um, they've been in for two weeks. We haven't had anybody mess with them. You know, the actual, you know, materials in it are of no value outside of what they, you know. The I just mean somebody wanting Sorry, and so I just mean somebody wanting to tear it up. Yeah, I mean, obviously they are out in the yeah. field. They could be tampered with. They are next to sidewalks, um, but we have done our best to, to try and at least keep them locked up so that people aren't going to try and, you know, pull. and they're, the, the nodes that are sending data back, they're mounted like seven feet up off the ground, and the little hockey puck is hanging off the edge of a bridge. So, My last question is, you sort of hinted at that a moment. Will there be a time when anyone can go online and at least see the – the measurements is that so we are we we will be working i am going to reach out to the intellisense they're the ones that basically host the dashboard for us um and and talk to them about how we can make this data publicly available without having people go into the dashboard um, since they are cellular based systems they have what's called an api which is a basically a way that you can port that data into like our gis system and, and we could have a public map that i would imagine would be able to show that data Thank you. Awesome. Love the tech. Uh, it was it was very exciting to get these things installed and up and running and see them constantly monitoring the water levels. And now every time it rains, I get to constantly check my phone and see, you know, how high is the water at you know Mud Creek at South Main and how high is the water at Seventh Avenue and um, it was so. like some wagering stuff right there. <laughs> um, so I do have a couple other updates, um, just uh, about. You know, program updates, um, the Comprehensive Stormwater Master Plan, which uh, uh, we've discussed briefly, and then some recent grant awards and applications. Um, so we, we have kicked off the Comprehensive Stormwater Master Plan. Um, these are the first two phases that we will be uh, conducting. The one is the development. We're working with W.K. Dixon, um, which is a great firm that does water resource engineering planning across the country. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing a strategic asset management plan, which is going to help us, you know, basically memorialize is the word that we've used, uh, but put together guidelines for our operation and maintenance strategies, our capital planning strategies, risk and prioritization of our assets. Um, and then I know you all have heard a, a, a lot of level of service when we talked about the rate study. Um, so we're going to be talking about level of service as well, but not in terms of what we discussed in the rate study, but in terms of the level of service that our actual system provides. So what size storm events can be passed by the system, um, meaning, you know, what size pipes and, and things like that. Are we going to make sure that we're designing uh, our system to, to meet <clears throat> certain storm events? Um, and then the master plan protocols. So after, so for phase two, um, we will, you know, prioritize the other areas of the city that have not been studied as intensely as Wash Creek, um, and then we will establish protocols for how we will model the system so that if we use a different consultant in the future or we want to bring on another consultant, everybody's using the same parameters to model the system, which for, in terms of planning and prioritizing projects is very important. Um, and we'll also develop standard operating procedures for the master planning and establish project development parameters. And then the, the recent grant awards. So this one, I'm excited to share this news. So I think last time I was here, we had received $240,000 grant <coughs> for Patton Park, or sorry, for Sullivan Park stream restoration. Since that time, we've been awarded an additional $70,000 to that. So that entire project is funded. We were also awarded $70,000 uh, for a rainwater harvesting system at the fire station one um, and so the water from the roof will be harvested in a large tank and we can use that water to uh, wash the trucks which I know the, the fire department um, will be very happy to, to have that water available um, and then we have submitted uh, the uh, grant applications for um, the lower Mud Creek floodplain restoration project um, 1.2 million will be if awarded will be utilized for flood reduction and then another 1.9 will be million will be uh, utilized for stream wetland and floodplain restoration the flood the land and water fund uh, application we spoke with the um, <coughs> grant administrators about a month ago and they notified us that um, of the 60 applicants or 60 people that submitted a letter of interest 
Um, they basically narrowed it down to 20 that they felt were a good fit for their program. We were in that 20 um, and that um, there's $15 million available in that program and $20 million in requests, which in terms of grant funding, that, that's a pretty, pretty good number. Um, some other grant funding situations, they'll have $50 million available and have received $250 million in requests. So, um, and then we also requested an additional $400,000 uh, to supplement that master planning budget. Um, and so we should find out about those in the spring. Hopefully I'll be able to return with some more good news uh, on those. And that, uh, this, oh, sorry. So the lower floodplain, uh, lower Mud Creek floodplain restoration, I, I know I presented on it briefly and it was like at the end of the night after a long meeting, but I just wanted, this is the location of where uh, that project is focused. And so, um, oh, cool. So this is Publix here, this is Ingalls, and this is Harris Teeter. Um, and so this parcel, is owned by the city, this parcel is owned by the city, and there's the dog park in Jackson Park, and we are you know, looking at potentially, we've applied for some funding to potentially acquire those parcels in the middle, um, and then we would utilize all of that open space for flood reduction, wetland, floodplain, stream restoration projects. Um, so that is the focus area of that project. Um, I, you know, always want to say when I'm talking about this project, this is not the silver bullet that is going to, you know, make sure this area never floods again. Um, but it could, you know, make a huge improvement in, you know, more le less frequent flooding and also really enhance the, the green space um, in that area. So uh, with that, I'll, any questions, feedback? Happy to. So just, if I'll make just a... Uh, I brag on Mike a little bit. We made a similar presentation to the chamber this morning, and um, he did a really good job. And what what is important for everybody to realize is is this work is really work that we have been doing for for not quite two years yet. Um, and I mean, we've been doing a lot of stormwater that's been going longer than that, but the stormwater utility has really been in place for uh, for two years, really. I mean, as far as it relates to the, to the true funding that we have to form this utility, so. Um, we wanted to share this information and remind people that, you know, that we're running it like a utility. We're using their stormwater money to, to make a difference as it relates to, to stormwater and flooding and issues. So um, this is not money that is tax money. Um, this is stormwater money, and we're using it like we said we would. And so it's important for the public to realize that it is making a difference in our community. Um, and so I appreciate the work that Mike and Dustin and um, – under the leadership of Brent De Detweiler, our, our city engineer. So just thank you, for Mike, and he did a good job, and it was very well received this morning at the, at the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I, I'll just add that, you know, any time we do receive a grant, that's additional, you know, revenue that we have in the stormwater utility that we can allocate towards other projects. Um, so, um, all right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. On the stormwater master plan, I apologize if I missed that in the slide. Is there any date about when that plan might be completed? So the first two phases we should have complete um, in the spring right. of 2023. Um, and then that's also when we should find. So we, we do have money allocated. Uh, we will be allocating money in the capital budget for a future phase of that um, because those two phases are not the entire plan. Right. But we have requested $400,000. So if we receive the $400,000, then we would be able to reallocate what we've tried to what we are planning to dedicate to that to other projects right so if we were going to set a date that we might be looking the at entire it, master plan yes two to three years okay once we have the protocols and the asset management plan in place we're really going to start digging into the modeling and the you know the the real benefit of that master plan is that you know we've done the wash creek watershed study um that's really the only um, assessment and capital project identification study that we've currently done. And so after the rate study and, and setting up the, the utility the way we have it set up, this is going to help us, well, this is, this is going to provide a roadmap for the stormwater program on where we can make the best investments in improving our stormwater system so that we're not just taking money from all of the rate payers and putting it into Wash Creek. And, you know, also it'll help us holistically prioritize projects based on things like criticality of failure, likelihood of failure, and, and the potential benefit of the project to the community and not just, oh, well, we identified this project first, so that's the one that we're going to spend money on first. No, I, I understand completely. I recall the presentation you made, Brandon, I'm not sure how long ago, but just all the places that 
we need to be moving the stormwater out of people's yards and into the street. And I think that's part of the master plan. That will, yeah. So the, the, the big, the modeling and the sub basin prioritization that will, you know, literally be evaluating pipe, you know, the pipes in the system for their capacity for, you know, um, similar to our water and sewer utility, you know, John spoke to it earlier, but we, we can have a system and not invest in it and it'll just fail when it fails. And then we have a big problem to fix, or we can make, you know, strategic investments before things fail and, and really save money and, and, um, you know, making those investments properly is, is the best way in my mind to run the utility. So thank you. Yes. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I like thank the you. festive sweaters too. Hey, bro. <laughs> okay, here we go. Come on now. All right. <laughs> uh, I got my tile. Um, all of our presentations, no public hearings, mm. no mm -hmm. unfinished business. So Merry we will Christmas move to on us. to mm. new business. Uh, allocation of city funds to support Apple Ridge affordable housing. <coughs> Mayor Volk, members of City Council, um, as you're aware, um, the Housing Assistance Corporation came before the City Council uh, in the last year um, and got a project, a project approved, um, Apple Ridge uh, Affordable Housing Project off of Sugarloaf Road. Uh, they applied for the historic tax credits um, and a large, uh, unfortunately, did not get the tax credits. Um, there was a development in town that they got the tax credits, so that'll move forward. But one of the large components of the project that um, it really would have been benefiting from the tax credits is the installation of the infrastructure, um, the water and sewer. And um, with the leadership of um, Council Member Hensley and, and, and other folks um, on the council, there's been a discussion about the city and the county working with um, housing assistance to get the infrastructure um, installed so that they can move forward with at least um, initially a portion of the project which would be single family housing um, along that and um, I think um, we've had conversations um, individually with City Council and staff feels comfortable saying that um, if Council wishes to um, allocate 800,000 to to match the county's contribution of 800,000 as a joint project to put together 1.6 million dollars to to fund the infrastructure um, of the um, or the water and sewer infrastructure associated with um, Apple Ridge that money is available and um, would be a good project to continue to move the needle on the affordable housing issue in our in our community um, and it, we're available to to move forward I think ultimately we would ask if you would like to do that is that you direct myself and the city attorney to work with housing assistance and the county to put together the necessary agreements to, to fund the infrastructure associated with Apple Ridge. So we'll stand by and answer any questions you may have regarding that. Questions? <clears throat> I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Um, and that is, first of all, I'm 100% behind this. Um, I do think that some type of reasonable time frame for housing assistance to build out the development should be part of the agreement so that it's not money that's just going to sit there and we plumb stuff out and then nothing gets built. Um, so my request would be that we ask the city attorney to, I've suggest, you know, in emails I've suggested three to five, I think five years is fine, but come up in, in negotiations with housing assistance with a reasonable time frame that some portion of this needs to be built out. That seem reasonable to people. Seems yeah, I mean, housing that. assistance is kind of here too. So, like, I think you could probably offer some input on yeah. timelines and that's time what, frames. We talked before the meeting. Oh, you did all right. Okay, yeah. okay. Then, that was yes. Okay. That's, that's what we agreed to. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Is that enough direction, Angie? For now, yes, sir. I'm okay. sure we'll come back with more. Right. Ask for more guidance, but for now, yes, sir. Okay. All right. And um, someone like to make a motion if there's no further do you, discussion. Do you have a comment? Uh, you want you want you want to say something, Susan? Well, I was just going to say Come on. we did talk before the meeting, and hopefully, uh, when Angie gets this drawn up, we could talk about the time frame. We may know sooner rather than later, kind of what that's going to be. We're 
definitely unsure about funding next year. We will reapply in January, um, but if you know what happened last year, you know the funding, we thought we were gonna know in August, we thought we were gonna know in September, and then I think we finally did know in October. What they did is took some of the money that they were gonna use this year and uh, funded projects that were funded last year that the cost rose on. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't as many projects granted money. So we expect that could also happen again next year. So if you'll just be willing to work with us on that time frame, um, I think Oklawaha took four years to actually get funded. Is that right, John? I think so. I think it was four. So just so you know, um, we do plan to try to start the single family as soon as we can work that out um, and come in off of an entrance off Prince Road so that we don't have to build that long road from Sugarloaf Road all the way through. So, and then I think the only thing I would add is I think I think we absolutely can develop an agreement um, and associate with the agreement with. Uh, I, I'm confident the city attorney uh, we we can put some language in there to address the 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 idea of we want the as much development on the site as it relates to affordable housing as possible for a couple of reasons. One, we need as many units as we can get, and secondly, we're putting a pretty robust pump station at this location and the efficiency of the pump station and how it works is it needs to have a, a substantial amount of flow of water to, to, to make it work so that it, it works properly and we're not wasting that infrastructure so we can work with housing assistance it's just it's important that we make a note that it's important to us to get as many units on that site as we possibly can for those two reasons thank you <clears throat> Anything else? Does any of that need to be added to this motion? I'm envisioning a three-party agreement that's going to have to come back for final approval. Okay. And so for now, I think we have the direction that, that if, it, if this motion, you know, is made and passed, we have the direction that we would need to move forward in developing that agreement. Okay. okay. So you suggest not passing a motion at this point, wait until we... No, ma'am. Th this motion is good. It's okay. But okay. we realize that there will be additional things that are going to come up that we'll have to address and bring mm -hmm. back in a fi final agreement to, for you all to give final approval mm -hmm. to. Okay. Right. Madam Mayor, I'm of the City Council, direct the City Manager and the City Attorney to work with Housing Assistance Corporation and Henderson County to fund the installation of water and sewer infrastructure at the Apple Ridge Affordable Housing Project in the amount of $800,000. Is there any discussion? Not. Those in favor of this funding say aye. 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 As opposed say no. Ayes have it. Motion carries. And uh, you can get to work on that then. Thank you. All right, uh, next, evaluation of purchase of Duncraggan Park. Mayor, vote, members of city council, um, at least a couple, if not all of you, have been approached by the Homeowners Association at Duncraggan about uh, turning over their uh, parkland, which um, to, for the public, they already understand there's, if you get to the end of 3rd Avenue and, and turn up to the left, uh, heading up West Lake, there's a, an, a green space area that is part of the Duncrag and development. Duncrag and um, you see a picture there. Duncracker is off to the right. Uh, they would like to to sell the city um, that property. It is currently parkland um, for or open space for the development. There's a small gazebo there. Um, uh, it is part of their open space um, requirement when the development was approved as far as the um, special use permit. So. We don't think there would be any issues. We'll, we'll consult with the city attorney about that. Um, and specifically, if the city maintains it as a public park, it's, it really is serving the purpose, its intended purpose, to be open space. But now it would be open to the public as a passive park, at least initially. Um, we see some benefits um, to acquiring this space in case we have to do, as you can see, there's a stream that runs through the middle of it. So if we have to do stream bank restoration, there's a small bridge. And if we wanted to widen um, Westlake a Avenue over time, having that property um, in the city's ownership would be some benefit. But uh, wanted before we go and get an appraisal, 
Um, we wanted to make sure that city council, councils in concern, concurrence that um, this property may be valuable and um, willing to at least consider a, a purchase of the property um, from the Dunn Craig and Homeowners Association. Just want your concurrence before we spend money on an appraisal. So it currently is their private property and supposedly public does not use it. But uh, so if it's turned over to us, they are aware that public can come on and do whatever they want there, right? Oh, well, within reason. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. So okay. that would be the absolute, you're absolutely right. It would become a public park and available um, for the public. Anything else? Anyone want to? Uh, I'll do that. Motion? Madam, Madam Mayor, I move that City Council direct the City Manager to obtain a pre <coughs> excuse me, an appraisal for Duncrag and Park. Okay. Is there any discussion? Not those in favor of obtaining the appraisal say aye. 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 As opposed, say no. Ayes have it, and something else can move forward. Uh, next, Parks and Greenway Master Plan Committee. Uh, Mayor Volk, members of City Council, as Mark Stirwalt's coming forward um, to give you a brief um, update about the, the committee and the request for proposal. Just a little background. Um, over the last 12 months, it, it, City Council has made it very obvious that park development <coughs> and, and park improvements are a priority of this board. And uh, we have uh, talked of, of whether it's about pickleball, uh, downtown park, <coughs> Um, other improvements uh, we have some we have some green space we have some land that that is off of uh, Clear Creek Road it's gonna be part of the Clear Creek Greenway so lots of opportunities heard very loud and clear that we're not going to get into the youth sports um, organization but we do have um, an interest of the City Council to to get in to expand how we're doing building parks and, and park development in the city so staff got together and um, after some work that Mark had been doing in his current position um, in as public works superintendent a lot of energy that he's putting in identifying park locations and park development to, to put a prioritization together and so that we can come back to council during budget cycle or in the future to, to really look at um, that is best let's let's up to date our master plan um, uh, four parks that the council did um, uh, s several years ago and, um, and 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 move forward so I'm gonna let Mark talk a little about the request for proposal um, as it relates to um, the park master plan sure it seems the the theme lately is uh, developing master plans and this is a, a key component of the 2045 comprehensive plan and our goal is really to develop a playbook moving forward. You know, what is our focus? What are our needs? And really addressing not just the needs of today, but also future needs. Um, ultimately, we really want something holistic. We want a usable document that will really um, map out a path forward. Uh, within that, it would cover um, virtually just about anything you could imagine and be a complete holistic plan that really lays the framework to set the city up for success. And we're hoping to um, <clears throat> make a, a fair and equitable plan that really addresses everyone in the city. Uh, we'll also be taking into account um, some of the Henderson County public school system properties, also um, Henderson County Parks and Recreation. And, you know, a big part of this is not just the public input and involvement, but we're going to be developing a, a master plan steering committee. So we will be um, looking to the council to um, provide input and uh, Right now, our recommendation is one city council member provide a citizen to represent them on the council. Um, and you can see on the document there, there's some other recommendations of who we are suggesting. It's still open. We can definitely add more people to this. But it would be a mixture of staff and community leaders um, really to address just a wide swath of uh, our citizenry. So just before we kind of move forward, obviously we will need some nominations from the city council. Don't expect that tonight, but just wanted your concurrence, um, <clears throat> the uh, makeup of the of the committee, um, and, um, and then we'll come back to you. Um, the RFP is going out here pretty soon. If it hasn't already, it's, it has not gone out yet. Yeah, but it's, it's going it's out here soon. Close. So we've got time, but we will come back and ask for um, some appointments at your January meeting. Um, 
and um, that way we'll have the committee together to help review the um, proposals and, and to go forward. So um, just want to get your concurrence that um, we're okay to do that. We're all in agreement on that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next, update regarding sustainability slash parks manager position. Okay. Uh, Mayor Volk, members of city council. Um, in last year's budget, uh, we got a, we had the council to approve a position um, associated. At the time, we were looking at creating a hybrid position as it relates to sustainability because sustainability initiatives such as solar, uh, you know, alternative fuels, um, efficiencies, things like it have been a priority of city council as well as parks management were um, a priority of the city council just as we we're doing the master plan. And so that the idea was the proposal at the time is that we would, we would create this hybrid position uh, and, and we we went forward out of the budget to do that and as we got into really developing the position and looking at the opportunities um, uh, for the position and how the position would work within our public works department we 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 went we've gone back and forth three or four times with that um, but again realizing that um, parks is a high priority and also realizing that sustainability is a high priority and when it came to the end of the day, um, we felt like that if we tried to have this hybrid position that we would be doing both parks and sustainability a disservice. Uh, neither neither um, area would get the attention that it needs. Um, and so we, um, to un Tom Wooten, who's out sick today, Tom and I have talked and Brian, we've, again, we really have literally gone back and forth three or four times. We started looking at how the makeup of the public works department, um, how the, our superintendent, our, our, our superintendent staff is made up, including Mark and then Brandon Mundy, who um, supervises a portion of public works too. So, if you remember, back up a little bit. If you remember, at one point it was Tom Wooten and then Chad Freeman as it relates to public works, and that between the two of them, um, they really were divided. They dividing and trying to conquer and so we were not getting everything done and then we we were able to last year add the position of um, a second superintendent position um, and that would be so now we have Brandon Mundy who supervises uh, the, the solid waste division as well as uh, streets and traffic divisions. Uh, Mark Steerwalt's position uh, currently f um, supervises and, and Mark you can correct me is, is Parks um, cemetery and grounds position and primary so park has mark has a lot of uh, primary day-to-day -day responsibility over parks and things like that and, and he has a passion for that um, currently not to put him on the spot so when we looked at um, the, the, what we needed to do with this other position we felt like really the thing that was missing was sustainability and it felt like that if we because if we were going to have this position we were going to have a hybrid position where you had a sustainability manager slash parks person. Mark and his team were doing parks and recreation too. So it was like, how do we fit the sustainability position? We would be taking stuff away from Mark, but then where he's been spending a lot of, and, 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 and I'll take Mark out of it because Mark may have interest in the sustainability position. Um, out of that position, if we take it, we're actually having two people kind of doing parks and half sustainability. Too. So what we've, our, our concept was, the decision we made is that we would create three superintendent, add a third superintendent position, um, all with equal um, pay grade. One focused, you know, uh, Brandon would, would focus, Brandon's position would focus on um, streets, solid waste, and traffic. The position that Mark's current in would, would folks and spend time looking at park development, uh, look at uh, cemetery, which is very much like a park, mowing grass, I mean, that really is a park in, in, in itself, and then building maintenance, which or facility maintenance, which inclu includes the pool and pat, you know, patent park and other repairs. So it felt like we were really going to be able to, and then create a sustainability superintendent 
then that really would work directly with the um, Environmental Sustainability Board to to look for grant. They would this person would also I think look at grants across the board, but would focus on environmental sustainability. Um, you know, as it relates to the ESB, uh, work with uh, Mike Huffman and other folks to, to 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 really move forward, move the needle forward on the environmental or on sustainability items. Again, building efficiency, solar, alternative fuels, everything that's associated with that. So the concept is we, we went from two people to now we really have five folks divided and we've divided up the areas and we really feel like by doing that, we can focus on the sustainability piece, which is a priority of the city council, but also the parks piece. Um, and that this position, while it's not currently titled as parks and recreation manager or director it's under that part that public works superintendent would have the critical job of of helping with park development and looking for opportunities um, to work with our other staff so i know that was a concern of this council that we do focus on parks and i feel like by by creating this third it actually helps us from having to create a fourth position down the road that we have these three superintendents uh, with their <clears throat> with their primary functions identified and their focus areas that can really help us move the needle on the priorities of city council so that's the method behind our madness um, i'll be glad to answer any more questions or if council feels like wow the city manager's lost his mind and he needs to go <laughs> a totally different direction um, I'll be happy to do that, but um, that just want to give you an update on, on where we were going. So, I'm very happy. I'm good. I'm happy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Thank you for being a yes man. All right. I'll, we just have too many things that. We have as priorities. <laughs> we, have a lot of priorities. we want to do this and that and the other thing. But I, I do think it's a good step for the city. Yeah. I mean, the only way it's ever going to happen is if somebody's dedicated their job all the time 100%. and figure out what's the best way to go forward. Yeah. So I think it's great that we've taken that step, and hopefully it'll pay dividends. Well, what I like to believe is, um, you know, you look at. Um, we've had a couple examples of our team tonight, but Mike Huffman's one of them. I mean, you, we. And, and again, under Brent's leadership, you know, we created the stormwater division, and you see that the dividends that it's paying, right? You see, you're, you're paying it, and it's not a waste of time and waste of money. So, there. Let's, let's see. All right. Um, e cancellation of the December 28th meeting. Yes, ma'am. Mayor Volk. Oh, ready just to make that. All right. Okay. Madam well, Mayor, I move the City Council cancel the <laughs> December 28, 2022 meeting. Uh, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Really good. I won't even ask for the no's on that one. <laughs> there is one item missing on the printed agenda, and that is the resolution. So if that, somebody that's could. That's what we were wondering about. Yeah, if somebody could pull up the agenda that maybe is on the screen there. We have a resolution there. Yes. As soon as it comes up, maybe it's 175 years. There we go, almost there. So, Mayor Volt, members of City Council, um, as they're pulling that up, um, just I'll, I'll briefly just a description that um, uh, Mayor Volk and and uh, Council Member Hensley uh, and John, uh, with um, myself and also members of um, County team being the chairman of the county commission and vice chairman of the county commission and the county manager went to winston-salem um, and visited with the folks from winston-salem um, they have a, a their utilities is managed by a, uh, a it's a commission it's a commission made up of 11 folks 10 folks or five folks appointed by the city five folks um, appointed by the county um, and then the chairman is appointed as a joint appointment from the chairman of the county commission and the mayor of Winston-Salem. Uh, the, the city of Winston-Salem owns and the assets to the utility. It is managed under the direction of the, the city manager and the utility director. Um, but it's a commission form of government to provide 
um, for all utilities um, within Forsyth County and Winston-Salem. Again, it is an urban air, a much more urban area than, than Henderson County, um, but it is, as, as, as you know, there's for a, a number of years, the county um, has been concerned about uh, the governance um, of the, our utility. Um, Seventy some percent of our cu water customers are outside the city. That continues to be an issue that's brought forward. So we thought that this potential is a potential way of, of maybe addressing some of these concerns associated with the governance, um, but at the same time maintaining the assets um, owned by the city um, and, um, and managed by the city. So. Uh, this, the, the folks that attended um, felt like this was uh, something that we should continue to um, explore. And at this point, our, um, with this resolution, it's a joint resolution between the, the Henderson City Council and the Board of Commissioners, that we explore the idea of, um, of forming a commission of governance of the system to hopefully put, put aside some of these, um, this longstanding debate over the governance of the system. So, do we put forward tonight um, this resolution for your consideration again to, to enter into negotiations and, and to just continue the discussion um, as it relates to the Water and Sewer Utility Commission? So I'll stop right there um, and try to answer any questions you may have um, and then um, or um, stand by for any other direction from the council. Comments? Um, I just have a few comments. Um, I think. Uh, an example of really strong and good leadership is having, uh, like, is making the decision to hire really great people um, to give you advice and to run departments. And three years ago, the city staff had the foresight to actually recommend us exploring this option. Um, and then COVID happened and, you know, everything. And so I think with all of the development that is happening in our area and in the county and the county commissioner's desire to um, preserve farmland and apple country and our desire to create infill and higher density and affordable housing just like tonight our partnership with them for um, Apple Ridge I can't think of like better ways for government to work together than to help create affordable housing for our residents um, I don't think everything is perfect and I think that this is gonna take a lot of time and uh, joint efforts from everyone uh, but I'm kind of excited at the the future of being able to create you know industry and you know I think about Jabel being a good example of us partnering with the county and you know imagine if we had industry that didn't have to go through you know all of the hoops to get water and sewer that they do now and so um, I'm just kind of excited to explore this option and at least hear it out. I know the commitment that every person on this board has to the city. Um, and I know that our, you know, our hearts and our minds are 100% to support the city. And so we wouldn't enter into something that was not good for the city. Um, and so I just am grateful that we're at least exploring it. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to see what happens. Okay. Other comments? Um, well, I've shared several comments with members of council before coming in tonight. I think a couple of things. I, I just have to say that, <clears throat> and I'm not saying this to uh, counter what John just said, but the longstanding debate is not within the city. It's the county that always has a problem. It's not like in the city we've been thinking about, gosh, we really don't want to run this anymore. So the longstanding debate is not within the city. It's the county's problem that we own an asset that they want to own. That's my perception. Um, I want to point out that in this debate here, I, I'm not aware of any request by the partnership for something like this. So the Partnership for Economic Development, my impression is they're happy with the way we work, especially the way we work with them. They've not asked, thinking this is going to be an improvement upon the water and sewer system by having this commission. Um, so I'm not aware of their requesting something like this. Back when, uh, Barbara, you can help me here, 2010, 2011, when McGrady and Apodaca were potentially looking to take over the system, um, and that was a little bit different. They were talking about taking over our system. I think the system was valued at $200 million plus at that time, as far as what the assets that it's worth. 
So it's, it's the most viable, other than the goodwill of the city and how we perform our services, it's the most viable physical assets that we own. And uh, my problem with the resolution <clears throat> in particular is number nine, where it says it is agreed that the water and sewer system in the county should be jointly managed. And I just can't agree to that because I've not been convinced. I, I'm welcome to explore, but I do not agree with that statement because I, there's not been enough facts presented to me to, that it should be jointly managed because I, I don't think it's being mismanaged um, currently. Um, and all you have to look at is the fact that you can't get a house in this county because everybody wants to come and live here. So, um, you know, the people are moving here with the way the system has been managed. And I'm more than, as a, I've said, I'm more than willing to explore it. And maybe there's a benefit to the city of Hendersonville. I have looked at some other ones, in particular the one in Orange County, to look at how other ones are set up. And maybe there's a benefit there. Um, but I guess I don't see the need to have this resolution, particularly with that wording in it, to move forward and discuss it. And so that's why I'm not in support of this resolution. There's a couple other things that I'm not a particular fan of, but that's the main one is I, I, don't, I don't right now, there's not the facts to me to say that it should be jointly managed. So that's my opposition to the resolution. <clears throat> no. um, I, I agree with Jerry in that I think part of this is to determine whether um, it should be jointly managed. You know, what, what, uh, how is it, how are things going uh, now? How would things change? Would it be a, an advantage to have it jointly managed? Um, that's probably a stretch, but I'm, I'm willing to support it um, with reservations, but, but I am willing to support it. So I would agree with the mayor that I'm willing to support it, but I do have reservations because I also agree with Jerry that the conflict is really not mm -hmm. within the city ourselves. Um, would I want to wordsmith a little bit? Sure. Is that something that we necessarily have to do for me to support it? No, because I think it's also important to note that this is just us Nick, taking the next right step in the process and it's not roping us into doing anything we're not saying this is you know we're going to explore it so i think if especially from staff's direction if it's the next right step to continue this conversation and figure out if it's something that we want to do then we should push forward with it i i, I think as the explorations go along uh, we'll have a better idea mm -hmm. on uh how this could improve the uh, the system for the the community, and if it turns out that it would not work for the city, we can say thank you. We tried, but mm -hmm. it's not going to work. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. What if we change "should" to "could"? Mr. Hunnett, or Miss. <laughs> Absolutely, City Council can can amend the resolution. I, however, I would caution you: we yeah. we have a, a, an agreement with the county that if we open if the if the council changes the resolution, then I think you may you're open the door for the county commissioners to change the re resolution. And I know mm -hmm. Mr. Smith doesn't agree with that, but I'm just saying that that that's in fact what we would be doing um, because we are so. Uh, I'll just caution you on that. So it could be a good preview well, if, of what if the further discussions will be. <laughs> one word in that whole thing, and they can't handle that. That's probably a good sign right out of the gate of how this is going to go. If we change it to could rather than should, um, because I mean I think that's what the what you both have expressed is 
maybe there's a way it works. So it's a could right now. I know that's a you know conditional verb to use, but you know, uh, so I'll, I'm sorry that the legal background comes out, but it's all about the syntax. Um, and those words have meanings. I know this is a resolution, but they definitely, verbs particularly, have strong meanings. <clears throat> I just feel like there are so many words and verbs that we could change out, mm -hmm. all of us. Yes. But this isn't tying us to anything specific, and I just think it's a good stepping stone for us to have further discussions. And I think in good faith, if we have all semi said we're kind of willing to look at it, and then we're going to just immediately start picking apart verbs and words, then then it doesn't seem like we're in good faith going to like actually look at it. And so, I mean, yeah, it's, I understand like Jerry's point on everything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I get it, but like if you don't take that first step, how do you actually ever know if if it's worth it or not and to me it's worth the first step to look into it and um I, i'm fine with the the words words and verbs the words and verbs. the words and verbs <laughs> sorry Jerry. that's okay no. <laughs> all right any further discussion right, well any? i'm i'm gonna yeah. at least make a motion about whether or not we change should to could okay so madam mayor i move that i'm pretty sure it's number nine on the whereas is yeah. the nine ninth whereas we change the verb should and I think that's the only should in there yes should to could okay the motion is to amend uh, that it's the last whereas yeah the last um, whereas uh, <coughs> strike should and insert could is there any further discussion not those in favor of the amendment to strike should and insert could say aye aye, aye. it was at two or three i can i guess three hmm? i said aye. aye okay three ayes uh those opposed say no 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 uh the ayes have it so the final whereas now reads it is agreed that the water and sewer systems in the county could be jointly managed among the county and city and maintained for the public good. So now the motion is back on the resolution as amended. Further discussion? Madam Mayor, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I move the City Council adopt the joint resolution in support of a consolidated water and sewer commission as amended. Okay. Is there further discussion? Not. Those in favor of the resolution as amended say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the resolution as amended has been approved. Mm. All right. right. Okay, um, that is all the new business. Uh, Ms. Murray, City Clerk, do you want to uh, talk about our regular meeting schedule for 2023? <laughs> I, 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 will welcome, I will welcome Jill Murray to her first meeting. She's, she's been here all of two weeks, so um, I, I will save her at this point and let okay. you know that um, uh, your uh, regular meeting schedule is in your agenda packet um, for the 2023 year. We'd ask the council adopt the regular meeting schedule um, as presented. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Is there any discussion? Or I guess we need a motion first. I, Are there any questions, first of all? I have one question. Yeah. About the April 6th meeting. Um, it's the, huh? I forgot. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. It's like the Thursday before Easter and I actually will be out of town, uh, for a ski nationals. So I was wondering if there'd be anybody who would be we'll move it to the next Thursday. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Henderson County's yeah, so spring what, break is like, yeah, but no, so Mm, don't get me started on that. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, we got the break when Blue Ridge breaks. But 
what Henderson County has done is the spring break is in March, but at Easter, we're off Friday and Monday. So we're out of school that Friday and then the Easter Monday. So Good Friday and, and then Easter Monday. And Easter Monday. So that so we're not out of school that day, uh -huh. but we're out of school the next day and then the following Monday. Mm -hmm. Could potentially give a long weekend to someone if they were interested. I mean, you mean like me? I don't know. <laughs> I have to, no problem with it. Can you get to Slovakia in that amount of time or wherever you go? <laughs> Slovakia. Uh, would, would that cause a problem for staff if we postponed that by one week? Uh, it should not. I'm thinking the budget. But no, it should not. It should not. If we're talking about the April meeting. Can, can I make a uh, suggestion? And that is, I know that we have the planning board, and the That's planning awesome. board is trying to work around us. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. by changing that, would throw off the planning board. Maybe. So could we potentially just approve the entire schedule except for the April meeting? Mm -hmm. or, or just approve it, and we can come back and amend it. Amend it. That's what you need. Okay. Yeah. That's and we understand okay. totally. But I, the planning board needs to know if we're going to change that date, because they got to change their meetings, don't we? Correct. Right. And I guess we need to make sure if that can happen. Correct. Good catch. So, all, right. all right. Thank you. Okay. Someone like to uh, make a motion regarding that <laughs> schedule? Madam Mayor, I move City Council to adopt the City Council regular meeting schedule for calendar year 2023 as presented. Okay. Is there any discussion? Not those in favor of adopting the schedule say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. Okay. That done. Uh, City Manager report. Just a couple items, Mayor, if I may. Um, I, I would like to, uh, Miss Williams left, um, but she asked for a little bit of a response related to Edwards Park, so I will um, try to cover that. Hopefully she's listening um, and, and as it relates to that. But a couple things she mentioned is uh, the, the moving of the fire station to Edwards Park. Just remind folks that we've said numerous times that we did look at building the fire station um, as associated with Edwards Park and the VFW. Um, remind the public and Ms. Williams that the, before we could make that happen, the property was acquired by Henderson County to construct um, the Veteran Services Center that they're moving there or the, the community center there. So there was not enough property left um, in Edwards Park to, to, to have enough property to build a fire station. And also it is uh, much closer to a residential area um, as it relates to our equipment leaving, particularly late at night. So we did explore that option. That was uh, one reason we delayed the construction of the um, fire station for almost a year as we look for alternatives other than um, Boyd Park. So just remind Ms. Ms. Williams about that and the public. So point that out. Second piece, uh, she's mentioned twice now about fire response. We are having to relocate um, fire apparatus um, and uh, have heard uh, concerns from the firefighters about that. I know the chief and, and Deputy Chief uh, Chavis is here tonight. I won't put him on the spot. Um, as we, for the year it's gonna take to um, construct the facility, we are looking, we have found alternatives to locate our apparatus around the city, one being at the Henderson County um, Emergency Management Building. Um, other apparatus will be um, station uh, at night particularly at station two with the firefighters but during the day we are look we are going to use i think we're going to utilize maybe the police department or other city facilities to put an, a peak truck a peak um, engine um, in close to the downtown area and and close to south um, hendersonville um, the southern area of the city to have that truck in close proximity to to maintain um, response times um, it's not ideal, but um, our firefighters, as we had a meeting in here just over a, a week ago, they are committed to providing great service to our citizens and realize that it's only for a year um, and we're gonna, we're gonna provide great services and provide um, um, the response times we need associated with that. So I just wanted to clarify that we um, hear Ms. Williams' concern, but we feel like we've addressed it by <coughs> staging a, a peak um, apparatus here in town to make sure we have the apparatus in the right locations to respond to those issues. So, um, so there is no delay in fire calls. No, no. Okay, just for the record, no delay in the public safety. Um, the the other thing I will will point out to um, 
We had an interesting, uh, I want to congratulate um, our communications team today, particularly Allison Justice. We had an, an interesting um, social media um, day, and I will say our, our um, communications team came through as champions. They, um, we embraced the, the fun that our community was having over a map. Um, the map is completely accurate related to the parade <laughs> and, um, and our detours. And, and Allison did a great job. And so um, I, just oh wanna, I just want to commend, I just want to commend Allison for, her, her, for the job she did today. She, it sounds she's, like something that's on the wall so, in the bathroom. So, so, um, exactly. so anyway, um, and Allison's upset. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and finally um with that being said uh, the, the 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 christmas parade is saturday and um so staff um uh, or excuse me the council will be riding in the parade we are um if, um we are um entry number four will be lining up on oak uh, i think in the parking lot um, we should, for council members who are riding, should be there um, by 5.30, um, and we'll be texting you um, other information as it relates to that. So I'll stand by. That's my report. Okay, the, the high school parking lot? Yes, ma'am. Yes, which will be lit. Okay. That's just, uh, okay. Well, lit. you know, we can do that, too, at the lit high school. Lit like those comments. Especially on the weekend. <laughs> okay. Well, that... Oh, sorry. Okay. I have a question uh, when you, yes. whenever we're ready. City Council comments. Yeah. John, when is the luncheon? Mm -hmm. Have you told us that December already? December yeah. the 14th. Yeah. I apologize if I missed that email. December the 14th mm -hmm. um, from 11 to 1. Is that right? And that is a Wednesday, I believe. Yes. It is a Wednesday. Okay. Thank you for asking. Yep. Okay. Anything else anyone wants to bring up? If not, we are at... <laughs> 